Thank you. Okay. Oh, I feel like the microphone's about to eat me. All right. So good morning to all of you. Welcome. Welcome to those who are watching online. Um, it's Palm Sunday. So this starts Holy Week. I don't know about you, but it can be a whirlwind of activity. Anybody get that? Whirlwind, I didn't hear any moans. Yeah, so, okay. Anyways, so yeah, it's one of those weeks where I don't know if you're like me, you've been cleaning, there's Easter egg making, there's all sorts of activities that go on during Holy Week. So, are there any announcements? Mark? Yes, I want to come up. Okay. Morning, everybody. Hey, I wanted to give you a quick fill in on Project Promise uh, that wrapped up last night. Uh, specifically, a couple of points. Several in the leadership and parenting group there asked me specifically to thank this congregation uh, for hosting them, for the, allowing them to be here and, and, and do their thing. So uh, several of them came to me and asked, will you talk to the congregation? I said, of course. So the parents, the leadership, they, they get us. They know where we're coming from. Um, I, my reply was, we want you here. We expect you here. It's, you know, we're very happy to have you. Um, leadership also of Project Promise, and for those of you who don't know, those are developmentally challenged adults, um, replied that we are the easiest church they have ever dealt with as far as their practices. And I said, well, that's real simple. I said, we know what difficult is. I said, we got rid of difficult about 13 years ago. And I said, that's, that's why we're the way we are. I said, you're, you're going to have any problem with us. Um, also, some exciting news. Um, without getting too technical, our wireless mic system is 25 years old. And it now operates in frequencies that cell phones do, and that makes problems. The greatness of it, I didn't have any problems, and I was talking with Mark Bickle about this thought. As cell phone technology has progressed, they've moved out of the bands that our system runs on. Yay for us. That means I can put parts, I can, the, the, the parts I need to replace are cheap, and uh, we can keep that system going. I'm not, I've been talking about an expensive replacement, and I don't believe that's the case anymore. So yay for that. Um, because we did have a mic go down in the middle of performance, unfortunately, and uh, I, I fixed it for the second round. But anyways, that system's going to get a lot better based on the fact that the cell phone technology has moved on and left us alone. So yay for that. Um, we filled the house uh, twice, and it was just a very good, uh, very good time together. Uh, they're very appreciative of us, and I want to make sure you all knew that. I need to get back up top. Okay, I saw somebody else. Uh, Renee, did you want to come up or do you want the mic? Okay. Okay, I just want to remind people to sign up for the Easter uh, breakfast. Um, the the uh, paper is on the table right as you walk into the fellowship hall. Uh, we only have uh, two people signed up, so I would appreciate if you would stop and visit that before you leave today so that I can know uh, what's going to be brought and what needs to be bought. Thank you. Yeah. Kurt's got one, so. I just want to uh, offer a few updates about Holy Week and some of the things that are happening here so you're clear about um, some details. Love Feast is on Thursday, 6.30. Uh, it's here. We've invited Goshen City Church to come and join us. 
Um, I think there'll be probably 16, 18 people from there. There's um, sort of firming up that list. Um, I've invited a couple of them to help with readings in the service um, in terms of participating. And I um, wanted to say to you, as the deacons were talking this past week, we decided that um, I, will, I will be in the Narthex area to greet you and them as they come in, uh, to give you a, a bulletin and a hymnal, and you'll go directly into the fellowship hall. We won't start here in the sanctuary. The whole service will be in the fellowship hall. So we just go right in there, and uh, I think some of the deacons will make sure that you find a place at the round tables that will be set up. Um, one of the things we'd like to encourage is for you to mix with people from Goshen City so that we have a sense of the larger uh, body of Christ as we, as we worship together for Love Feast. Um, we'll have the, we'll have the uh, agape meal, which is a symbolic fellowship meal, and then we will wash feet and hands, and so um, there will be feet washing circles just off the edge of where we're sitting for the meal, so there'll be a, a circle for men only, for women only, for mixed men and women, and then a circle for washing hands. And all of that will be explained that evening, but I just wanted you to know so you can kind of have it in your mind as you're ready to come, um, some of those details. And we look forward to being together for that service, um, and thank you to the deacons who are doing hard work to not only get it ready for us, but to host Goshen City as well. And so we're really, really looking forward to that. If you have any questions, let me know, um, and we can, we can answer those uh, questions. I do need um, one more person for a scripture reader for that service, so uh, if you're interested in doing that, um, see me after worship, and I'll get you lined up with that particular scripture. I also want to say... Um, about uh, the sunrise service. Um, I'm gonna assume that many of you are familiar with uh, that service, but maybe there's some who aren't. And so it's at the Poyser farm. The entrance to come into the farm is not their driveway to their house, but uh, the drive just to the east of that. It's like a gravel drive and you'll drive around the, the barn and the silo and up the hill. And you can drive all the way to the site where we will actually have the service. So um, it's accessible. There'll be uh, lanterns marking the way. And um, two, two important reminders. One is um, it's, not a, it's not a real long service, but it may be a little too long for some people to stand the whole time. So bring a lawn chair, or if you need one, let me know. We'll work, we'll work that out. Also, dress warmly. Um, if you haven't gotten reminders in these last couple of days that, you know, spring may have come, but spring's not here, um, it'll be dark as we're arriving. It's a sunrise service, so, you know, hats, uh, gloves, scarves, whatever, long underwear, whatever keeps you warm, um, wear that so that you're not uncomfortable as we join together for that service. But the, the emphasis is to welcome the resurrection of Christ as the sun rises that day. And so we look forward. And again, we've also invited Goshen City folks to come. So all of you have some responsibility to be um, welcoming hosts for both Love Feast and Sunrise Service. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to our time together at those services and then for Easter Sunday uh, here in the sanctuary later that morning. Okay, that's a lot longer announcement than I intended to make, but kind of feel like as we know what we're looking forward to, it helps us to be ready. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Please join us as we enjoy the prelude.
A call to worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say, his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness, that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Bind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. And now for the opening prayer. Join me. Mothering God, we join you on this Palm Sunday. We remember the events that have come before and the events that will come in this next week. We thank you for the journey that your son took, starting at the top of the hill in Bethphage, Bethphage, as he rode his way down a steep, winding, stony path into his triumphal entry into the gate of Jerusalem as he anticipated his coming week. So we thank you for the gift of your son and for the gift of old memories and of new memories that will be created this week. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. The hymn we're going to sing next is an insert, Jesus is Coming. Before we stand, since this is a, a new song, and it's a fun song, it's upbeat, kind of syncopated. <clears throat> so I will, excuse me. <clears throat> I'll sing through the, the verse and the way, if you look at your, your insert, the uh, Jesus is coming is written there, and we, we sing that, and then the refrain, and then we're going to sing two additional verses in the very tiny print at the bottom. Um, the first, I'm sorry, the second verse is going to be release for the captives, and then we'll the third verse is hope for the suffering. And, and I'll cue you on that before we start each verse. Okay. So th this is what it, the rhythm of it. Jesus is coming, pave the way with branches. Jesus is coming, Hosanna. Jesus is coming, pave the way with branches. Jesus is coming, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus is coming, Hosanna. <clears throat> Lost my place. Prince of Peace, Hosanna. Jesus is coming, Hosanna, to the Prince of Peace. Okay, so now please stand as you are able. When I searched this out on YouTube, a couple of the renditions just had somebody doing the drum and singing an a cappella. That was a little beyond me, so we'll do it with guitar. So Jesus is coming, 
release for the captives, hope for the suffering, and then repeat verse one. And I'll, I'll cue you as well. Jesus is coming, pave the way with branches. Jesus is coming, Hosanna, repeat. Jesus is coming, pave the way with branches. Jesus is coming, Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus is coming, Hosanna to the Prince of Peace. Hosanna, Jesus is coming, Hosanna to the Prince of Peace. Release for the captives. Release for the captives. Pave the way with branches. Release for the captives. Hosanna. Release for the captives. Pave the way with branches. Release for the captives. Hosanna. Hosanna. Jesus is coming. Hosanna to the Prince of Peace. Hosanna, Jesus is coming. Hosanna to the Prince of Peace. Hope for the suffering. Hope for the suffering. Crave the way with branches. Hope for the suffering. Hosanna. Now it's our offering time. I'd like to uh, invite you to leave your offerings in the back. I recognize there are other ways that people turn in their offerings. Um, I do mine online. But I'd also like to um, extend gratefulness to the other ways that people serve and offer their, well, their selves here in the congregation. The beautiful, the beautiful visual behind me, uh, Lori's playing. So there are other ways that we offer of ourselves um, during the week. So you want to bring it forward? <coughs> I'm reading a prayer from Common, World, Common Word out of Winnipeg, Canada. Blessed are you, God, and the one who comes in your name. Like the palms laid down on a road long ago, we prepare to lay down our gifts gifts that ready our world for your coming, gifts that open our eyes to your appearing. Let us not misunderstand your entry into our lives. Hosanna, save us, let us walk with you. And everyone said, amen.
For uh, 20 years, um, I was at the Manchester Church of the Brethren before coming here. And uh, during our prayer time in the morning, um, people had perhaps turned in their uh, prayer concerns or we had collected them through the week and one person would name them. And I got quite used to that, um, being the voice of the sharing time. And so coming here and hearing your voices and hearing your sharing has been different, but I like it. I like it more and more. Um, I like that we share our lives, um, that we speak the things that are close to our hearts, uh, that we hear each other, that we support each other. And I think it is truly a gift um, of this congregation to be in the spirit of sharing in so many ways, but especially the things that uh, we want to offer to each other and offer to God in prayer. So we open up that time now for your sharing. Are there things that you would like to put before the body in a spirit of prayer? I was going to say, after all that, somebody's got to have something to share. All right, here we go. Jill over here. Good morning, Jill Weaver. Um, several gratitudes. Thank you all for singing that new song. I, <laughs> I love working on new stuff. And we sound good. I, you know, there are times when I just stop singing over here. We really sound good. So keep singing your hearts out. Um, a couple other gratitudes, particularly today. Mark, he spoke about Project Promise. Mark. Matt and William also they were here late and it was really fun to talk to Mark directly um, he loves doing that and I, I said to him it, it's such an incredible gift to the community and, and he puts in a lot of time and I like I said I know Matt and William the behind the scenes people um, we have a tendency to forget so thank you for that you three in particular and, um, and just, just a general gratitude to us as a body. Um, it's, it's just really nice to be here in whatever space I'm in, you know, and know that I will be well received. Um, so thank you. Hi, this is Renee Black. Um, I might like to ask prayer for my uh, sister's husband, Bruce. Um, he is traveling today to pick up his brother, who has been kind of a prodigal son in the family. Um, his brother had uh, moved to Mexico and is involved in some potentially illegal situations. Uh, his brother... Uh, had a series of strokes and has become uh, somewhat disabled. And as a family, my brother-in-law is going to bring him home and care for him. We're very worried because we don't know what that means for my brother-in-law. He's been so anxious about it and he has tried to pave the way all the way through, but not knowing has caused him a lot of anxiety. He ended up in the hospital uh, last week because of his anxiety. And so just a lot of prayers for that family that's trying to rescue their family member from a very potentially volatile situation. Yes. This is Beth Molnickel, an update on Maxine. She's still at the rehab, the Laurels of Goshen. She's gotten a lot better, although today she's not doing well, but that's her ongoing issues. Uh, the pneumonia is gone though, and she's doing much better. She's in rehab. She thinks she'll be coming home Friday. Gary Black here. Um, anyway, um, in Sunday school this morning, it was uh, such a blessing. We, uh, 
you know, one thing that I that comes out for me is how it was shared that how as a congregation, as a class, we all come together and, and share openly and honestly. That means so much to me um, in this congregation and what what we we are doing and what we have become. And that is rare. And I just wanted to say it is such a blessing and it is so heartfelt and thank you. Hi, this is Martha Hubert, and I want to thank God this week for the safe return of my son from his adventures in La Coruña, Spain. It took him 23 hours to get home, one train, one bus, one delayed flight, one misconnection, and then another misconnection. But he's back at his home in Maryland, and uh, he says it was a wonderful conference, and while they were there, they visited the town of Santiago, Spain, and entered and worshiped in an 800, in, in a cathedral built in the year 800. Carrie Anderson. Don and I have seven grandchildren. Um, we're really fortunate and uh, finally, our youngest is going to IU. <laughs> is this a joy or a concern? What's it? <laughs> oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Britta Graber here. Um, next Sunday, we will not be here. We are going to Florida for spring break. So we will be <laughs> traveling deep. Um, we're taking, obviously, all of our children. We're not gonna leave them home for 10 days because that's not good. Um, and we are also taking their older sister, Kenzie. So we are pretty excited to have her um, come with us when they first were placed with us. Kenzie stayed with us too for a couple weeks. Um, so she's wonderful and we're super excited. So we'll be at Bob and Nancy Hawkins house. It's a two bedroom house and they will be staying with us and then we are showing up with seven people. So pray for Bob and Nancy. <laughs> Bernard Vole. I have joys and concerns. Um, I had a week in Arizona with my kids, and that could not have been better. Absolutely fabulous, and enjoyed that time together with them. Um, <clears throat> I, I did not come back with good news from, from Mayo Clinic, <clears throat> and um, I've been doing holistic care since January 28th, and this Tuesday uh, will be the defining moment uh, as to whether anything is working as I go to IU Med Center for my next CT scan. So I ask the congregation for prayers that uh, the good Lord will look down on me and maybe decrease those nodules in my lungs. Um, Mayo Clinic said that um, they only see about 2% that make it uh, with lung cancer. So um, I'm hoping to be part of that 2%. Dallas Andrews back here. Um, Wayne had a heart cath on Thursday. Thank you, first of all, for your, for your prayers. Um, the doctor, the cardiologist, was surprised that there were no blockages, and so there were no stents put in, and we were really grateful for that. Um, however, in a few weeks, they will be putting a chip in his um, heart area, in his chest, so the doctor can monitor. There's some uh, rhythmic 
problems going on and the doctor isn't sure why. So he wants to be able to monitor Wayne and see if he can figure out what is causing the rhythm to um, act like it does. So uh, we ask for ongoing prayers for that. Um, we, were really, we were really grateful at the outcome today. This week he has had, um, he has had Men Meniere's disease for a long time, for a number of years, and he, that kicked in this week too. We've uh, got a full moon coming tomorrow morning, and that affects um, Meniere's disease. So he's been very off balance, and that's why he decided not to stay today. So he's, he's just had some ongoing challenges. Olivia and um, our daughter Olivia and her wife Amy were here to um, Amy's aunt died unexpectedly in, in, in early November, I guess it was mid-November. And um, she, she came home, she and Olivia flew home to help her mother go through the aunt's things. They're traveling today, so I'm asking for travel mercies for them. Let's join our hearts in prayer. We pray to you, O God of our salvation. You are the God who brings your people through the waters and through the desert. You are the God who brings your people through the valley of the shadow of death into green pastures beside still waters. You are good to us, O God, merciful and compassionate. You are also God of justice, of making things right, you do not abandon the oppressed. You do not forget the suffering. And so we, your people, must do the same. We must not abandon the oppressed. We must not forget the suffering. Help us to set aside our self-centeredness, our fearful anger. You make a wide path, O oh God, a sustainable way. If only we would choose your way. Restore us, reorient us, that we might not wander from the path of righteousness. On this day of waving palm branches and shouts of Hosanna, receive us in our vulnerabilities, in our disappointments, we pray. There are things we can change in this world and there are things we can't. We surrender to you in trust that you will make a way. In our praying just now, we hand over to you all the ways in which we are hurting, our physical illnesses and diseases, our failing bodies, our anxiety about the future, our damaged spirits, our grief, our broken relationships. But we also offer to you all our gratitude for the things that have blessed us, surprised us, connected us in new and renewing ways. On this day of waving palm branches and shouts of Hosanna, we confess, too, that we have much in common with the characters of the Holy Week story. The people who betray trust, those who are caught up in the crowd, the ones who want something and then when they don't get it, move from for to against, those who deny any association that might endanger them, those who wash their hands of any responsibility, those who mock the suffering, those who weep at the foot of the cross, those who hide behind closed doors, we can find ourselves in the story. And so we ask for your mercy. Save us in your mercy. Thank you, God, for sending your Son so that we might know you and understand you better. Find ourselves called to be your children. Have a new vision for humanity. As we move into this week to come, sharpen our memories, but also give us a clear and honest view of ourselves, our behaviors, our motives, and yes, our path forward. We pray now in the name of Jesus, who came to challenge us, to help us, to heal us, to save us. Amen. Our scripture reading 
is Mark 11, 1 through 11. I don't have a large print, so off come the glasses. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, The Lord needs it, and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing, untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David! Hosanna in the highest heaven! Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And so ends the reading. Uh, the hymn is Ride On, Ride On in Majesty, number 239 in your hymnal. I haven't been keeping a running count, but um, this has been quite the day for hosannas. They've been stacking up uh, in scripture, in song, uh, in prayer. But then again, when else do we get to use that word, that cry, except on Palm Sunday? Because I imagine you know that worship-wise, the shelf life of hosanna is one Sunday only. Hosannas are for Palm Sunday while hallelujahs are for Easter. Now, what's the difference between hosanna and hallelujah, you may ask? Well, the difference is this. While hallelujah, a word found at the beginning and end of a number of psalms, is a Hebrew liturgical expression that is most often rendered in English as praise the Lord, 
Hosanna is actually a combination of two Hebrew words, one that means deliver or save, and the other that means be or beseech. So while the word hallelujah is a praise God expression, the word hosanna is a cry for help. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Hosanna, save us, we beg you. Help us, free us. And in terms of worship, we cry out Hosanna on Palm Sunday, save us, help us, in memory of the crowds of people who cried out Hosanna to Jesus as he entered Jerusalem. And as we do that, we also recall that Hosanna, in just one word, is the call of the people for a Messiah an anointed one who will save or deliver Israel from the occupiers, from the Roman army. Save us, we beg you. It's an expression with some intensity, isn't it? Save us, be a savior for us. Intense, demanding, expectant. But then again, when your life is at risk, when your livelihood is overcome with a tax, heavy tax burden, when your quality of life is suppressed, when your ability to get ahead is squashed, when your daily life and your daily freedom is constrained by the oppressing presence of an occupying army, then no wonder you hope for a savior. No wonder you call out for salvation. Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Of course, those Palm Sunday people who called out to Jesus are not us. They're people from long ago and far away. And so it may be tempting for us to think that because they are not us, even though they are calling for a Savior, we don't need to call for a Savior. After all, our Insulated lives are fairly stable, fairly predictable, not without some bumps, some obstacles, but nothing we can't handle. And yet, even as we may think that way, we are likely living closer to the edge than we would like to admit. In the blink of an eye, even basic things that we take for granted could be taken away. And then what? Who will save us? Who will help us? Saturday a week ago, I took my daughter, Lena, to Goshen College for Admitted Student Day. The morning activities included an information session for parents led by a panel of college staff, while the prospective students went off to get to know, meet with other prospective students. Everything went well in the morning for both of us, for me and for Lena. I learned some new things. She met some new people. In the afternoon, we thought we would be leaving after lunch, but it turns out she wasn't finished with her conversations and visiting with other students. So I went and sat in the car in the parking lot of the college Mennonite church, anticipating that my wait would not be very long. Quite some time passed. I think she forgot about me. And finally, she texted to tell me that she would still be a while, and perhaps I could go on home and then come back later to get her. That sounded fine to me. I was tired. I still had some work to do to complete my Sunday preparations. So I turned the key in the ignition and nothing. Just a couple of clicks, but no engine starting up. What was going on? As you might imagine, I had somehow turned the headlights from the auto setting to the on setting, and so I had drained the battery. I unlatched the hood of my car and propped up the hood, which I think is the universal signal for car trouble. It is, in a not-so-subtle way, a cry for help. Several people walked by in that parking lot, but no one turned their gaze in my direction. One young man even pulled into the space facing nose to nose with my car. Mind you, my hood is up, 
pulled into the space, got out of his car, and went to walk away. And I said to him, please, don't park there because I'm going to need a jump for my battery and I need access. And he glared at me, got in his car, zipped out, went two spaces down and pulled in and walked away. I called campus safety and security and asked them for help, but they couldn't help me. I called AAA. They said they would send someone, which they eventually did. In the meantime, however, one person did stop and offer to help. It was a young woman with three small children, three girls. Her boyfriend was following along behind her. She paused by my car and she said, do you need help? I said, yeah, I, I need a, a jump for my battery. She said, do you have jumper cables? I said, unfortunately, I don't. She said, I'm sorry, I don't either. I wish I could help you. I said, it's okay. She said, I hope things work out. The two smallest girls each took turns hugging my legs before they ran off with their mother. Finally, the AAA man came from the towing company, only he didn't bring a tow truck. He brought a tiny little white van, and he was a very small man. And he got out of his little tiny van, and he had a little tiny battery pack, and he put it on my car, hooked me up, and he said, okay, you can start it up, which I did in just a moment's time. He took his little battery pack, got back into his little van, and drove off. Now, like most of you, I am used to being able to go where I want to go, when I want to go. But for several hours, I was stuck. And I needed help. And I was saved that day, not from danger, not from a threat to my life, not from some eternal fate, but I was saved from my circumstance of being stuck with no way home by that little man with the little van and the little battery pack. You're clear on that part, right? <laughs> but those two little girls who each hugged my legs and their mom who offered to help even though she didn't have the tools to help, they saved me too. They saved me from disappointment in everyone else who walked by on the other side of the road, so to speak. Salvation in the day-to-day -day lives we live in this world, as well as in the Hebrew tradition, is a very physical, tangible experience. It most likely has something to do with being saved from danger, or saved from circumstance, or even saved from despair. A savior, then, is someone who helps us in that very physical, tangible experience of life, someone who rescues us or grants us our freedom, which in my case was the freedom to drive home. I told my dead battery story to a couple of people the next day at church last Sunday, and one person said to me, I live close to where you were. You could have called me, and I would have come and helped you. And I was pulled up short as I thought to myself, oh my, how did I forget that? How did I forget that I have people now in Goshen, in Middlebury? Not just people who would help me if we were able to plan ahead, but people who would help me if I was stuck in the moment or lost or even in danger. Salvation might not just come from strangers, it might come from sisters and brothers. But for that to happen, I have to be open. I have to be aware. I have to look in the right direction. I have to look at my own circumstance, my own struggle, and at the same time, look for a source of help, of freedom. And then maybe I have to change my assumptions or my expectations as well. Maybe I have to surrender, accept help. Maybe I have to change directions, change my attitude, soften my heart. Maybe I have to admit that I need saving, that I can't save myself. 
Maybe I have to accept that salvation may look different than I anticipated. Maybe what saves or who saves me also surprises me. Hosanna, save us, we beg you. Kathleen Norris, in her book, Amazing Grace, a Vocabulary of Faith, unpacks a variety of different theological words, words like repentance, idolatry, incarnation, and faith. But one of the words she addresses is the word salvation. In the chapter about salvation, she tells the story of a young man who ended up in her kitchen one Sunday morning after Norris's husband David had brought him home on Saturday night from the bar where David worked because the man was too drunk to drive home. Norris tells how this young man shared his story with her over breakfast. His name was Willie. He had worked in the oil fields during a boom time, took a lot of risks, made a bunch of money. Then between jobs, he had come home to visit his parents, was heading to Alaska where he had heard there were more opportunities, but had gotten sidetracked when he met up with some drug dealers in Wyoming. And they together had hatched a plan to make even more money than he had ever made before. He'd come home again then because things had gotten too rough. There in the kitchen, he tells Norris lots of tales about what had happened along the way to bring him to this point. But the meat of the story, as Norris recounts it, goes like this. He said that he had thought things were working out fine. He and the guy he was in business with were making good contacts setting up their dealing network, and it felt lucky, he felt lucky to have fallen in with someone with so much experience. Then one day, as they were driving on the outskirts of the small city that was to be their base of operations, his friend veered suddenly onto the shoulder of the road. He had seen an acquaintance driving past in the other direction and was debating whether to turn his car around and follow him. I need to kill him, he said matter-of-factly reaching for a gun that Willie had not known was stashed under the front seat. I need to kill him, but he's with someone, and I don't know who, so it'll have to wait. Damn. It was right then I decided to get out, Willie said. This was over my head. And that is salvation, or at least the beginning of it, Norris continues. The Hebrew word for salvation literally means to make wide, to make sufficient. And Willie recognized that the road he had taken was not wide enough to sustain his life. It was sufficient only as a way leading to death. Norris then goes on to explain that in the Bible, the primary meaning of the Hebrew and Greek words translated as salvation, the primary meaning is non-religious. The Hebrew word for salvation usually comes from a military context, referring to victory over evil or rescuing from danger, while the Greek words are often referring to physical healing. So the phrase, your faith has saved you, that Jesus says, actually means your faith has made you well. She says, it seems right to me that in many instances in both the Hebrew scriptures and the gospels, that salvation is described in physical terms because I believe that this is how most of us first experience it. Only later do the more spiritual implications of salvation begin to make themselves known. She turns back to Willie's story. Having turned suddenly from the path he was on, he seemed a little bit lost, but also glad that he had been able to name something as wrong and walk away from it. In doing that, he had tasted a kind of freedom, and he wasn't sure what to do about it except to tell the story. He felt good, but uneasy, unsure of what to do next. So I tell those stories, and what it means to be saved seems fairly straightforward, maybe even simple, Even when we aren't sure what's next, many of us can access this freedom to change in attitude, to turn in direction. But what about the not so simple? 
What about those who need the very real and physical salvation of, say, medical supplies or food or shelter from bombs and gunfire, salvation from being held hostage or held in captivity? There is desperation and deprivation so intensely present in the world today, children especially, who need to be saved. What about them? Hosanna, save us, we beg you. On Palm Sunday, the crowds call out to Jesus. It is a very particular time in history, a very particular situation. They went out of their oppressive situation. They need a different path, a wider road. And so they want someone to help them onto that path. They want someone to save them. The Roman occupiers must go. That's the presenting issue, the thing with which they need help, the thing that they think is blocking their freedom, the obstacle. But I wonder whether there are other things that have perhaps tipped them over the edge and tip us over the edge. The economic disparities between the haves and the have-nots, the promises unkept, unfulfilled, by political leaders and religious leaders, the lack of freedom to choose a new direction, a new way of living. They want something from Jesus, but what is the salvation they are seeking? Is it an overthrow or an adjustment? Something that someone else will do or something in which they can participate? We know even if they didn't know at that moment of crying out that Jesus wasn't going to overthrow the system for them, at least in the way they were imagining. He would oppose the injustices, but he wouldn't rise up in military leadership. Jesus wasn't going to plot and plan some kind of violence. The cross is coming. Crucifixion is coming. But Jesus would not walk through that door of aggressive defiance in order to bring people into a new reality. No, the new reality is access through an inside-out process. It's a turning of things upside down by breaking the cycles of violence and injustice and retribution. The help Jesus brings is the help of strong hearts, clear vision, deep integrity, and consistent courage. And the reminder that systems change only when we change. I can imagine the response of Jesus to the cry of the people as he sits on that colt. Help you? Yes, let me help you. Let me help you face whatever is ahead. Let me help you face the fears that block you from standing up for what is right. Let me help you envision a new world. See a new world coming. Save you? Yes, let me save you. Let me save you from your worst impulses, from bitterness, from judgment, from aggression. Let me save you from vengeance, from the intense temptation to vilify, dehumanize others in this large human family. The coming kingdom isn't a return to the glories of the past. The coming kingdom is a new promise of a world changed by love and grace. We pray this day, may God save us and everyone who suffers. May God help us and everyone who struggles. Hosanna, save us, we beg you. Save us from reactivity born from our fears. Save us 
from becoming the evil we oppose. Save us for the sake and purpose of creating a world reshaped by love and peace. Save us in all these ways, we beg you. Amen. I invite you to stand in body or in spirit. Our closing hymn is number 261. I will sing the Lord's high triumph. It's going to play it through once. May God save us and everyone who suffers. May God help us and everyone who struggles. Hosanna, save us, we beg you. Save us from reactivity born from our fears. Save us from becoming the evil we oppose. Save us for the sake and purpose of creating a world reshaped 
by love and peace. Save us in all these ways, we beg you, O God. Amen.